Hey there, it's Mike Lankford. Welcome back to the Modern Financial Advisor Podcast. It's so wonderful to be with you again. Frankly, I've missed you, baby. It's been a couple of months since we published our last episode. Now, some of that was by design, and some of that was just, you know, summer stuff. My son graduated high school. We took a trip, then we took another trip. Then, uh, oh, by the way, we had to get our son off to college. That was pretty cool. My daughter started high school. So you had all that type of stuff going on. But the reason why, the real reason why there's been a hiatus for the show is we have been retooling the show. You're going to notice a new look and feel. And frankly, if you're seeing this on video, you're noticing a new look and feel. You're also, if you're looking at your Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Amazon, the YouTubes, or wherever you like to get your podcast jam on, you're also noticing a new <laughs> look and feel, right? You're seeing that new design. Hope you like it, by the way. Love to hear what you think. Really leaning into the modern financial advisor concept with a little, uh, you know, mid-century modern feel. That's where that's coming from. We kind of went with a little Hitchcock-y feel on the design. I hope you like it. Let me know. I love to hear from you. Anyway, the show is going to be basically the same, right? I'm here. You're here. Carl's here. That's a Phineas and Ferb reference for those of you who are like tuned in. Anyway, that stuff hasn't changed. Great guests, great topics, great strategies, introducing new tech, all that good stuff for the modern financial advisor and the modern financial advisory firm. But we're also going to have some new sponsors, and that's really cool too, right? To have new companies involved in this podcast. Can't wait to introduce you to them. Awesome, awesome stuff. Now, let's get to today's show. Today's show, I have Paul McManus, the author of The Short Book Formula, and we're going to be talking about, well, why financial advisors should be writing a short book and how they can use it in their business to grow their business and to just expand in new ways. And uh, that's all awesome stuff. But also, Paul's going to talk to you about a little bit about his business and how they do it, how they make all this type of stuff work. So really, really good stuff. I loved it. I tell you what, as I as mentioned at the beginning of the show, Paul and I hit it off really well. And we feel like we've been like dudes for a long time. And uh, I love when I have a guest like that, where I just feel really comfortable with them. The conversation flows. Um, I'm sure we'll have Paul on as a guest in the future as well. Just an excellent guest, lots of great content. I think you're going to love them as much as I did. Okay, well, that's enough of an intro from me. Let's get to our conversation with Paul McManus. Well, Paul McManus, welcome to the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. So wonderful to see you. It's great to see you as well. Excited to be here. Uh, dude, I would be excited to be there too, because you are in my favorite place in the world, San Diego. And I just like... I'm jealous of you. I'm very envious, particularly today, because it's like another 100 degree day here in Austin. It blows, dude. So I'm very envious. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting that you say that. And it's interesting that you're in Texas about, I want to say six or seven years ago, I had San Diego fatigue. I'm like, oh, another great day. Blue sky, you know, perfect weather. You know, I'm sick of this. And I made the decision to move to actually Texas. I went to Houston. And it was only then that I saw I, I I realized how I actually missed San Diego specifically for the weather. I, I thought you know Texas yeah. and Houston and Texans are amazing. I love them, but the weather it's hard to beat San Diego's weather. No, oh, it's I, God. It's, it, it's just such a beautiful place too. If you've never been to San Diego, it is exactly as good as they say it is. Uh, you, know, you have Southern California traffic, but if you're in Austin, people are whining about the traffic here all the time, which. I find comical because I'm from the Boston area originally, and you don't know traffic until you've been to Boston. So. <laughs> of course, <laughs> it's like of ten o'clock at night. Of course, traffic. Of traffic. Of course, traffic for me is pretty much. I, I I get up, I stumble over two Boston Terriers, I walk across the apartment, uh, uh, and I have arrived at my office. Very good. Hey, by the way, Boston University alum, go Terriers. Boston Terriers. <laughs> by the way, thank you for mentioning your, like, I'm glad we brought up our locales because that really does explain the 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 portrait of the background, the, the print in the background of the, of the Longhorn there. I'm like, why does he have a, a steer in the background? He's in San Diego. Is that, I don't remember on my flight into there seeing many cattle ranches and that probably explains. That's a great observation. I don't have a good answer for you other than my wife wanted to make the background a little bit more fancy and that was her <laughs> choice. Although again, she was with me in Texas, but she's originally from Japan. So I'm not quite okay. sure what her thinking was. Well, there you go. Okay. Well, wives are great for helping us decorate. Yes, Fantastic yes. stuff. Awesome. Keeping us dressed well so we don't look like idiots when we leave the house and all <laughs> 
<laughs> well, all right, let's let's jump into the reason why you're here, because I have to say, Paul, I feel like you and I are kindred spirits if people can't already tell from the way that we're already it's like flowing on the show. Prior to this, by the way, we only had one 30 minute prep call <laughs> and a couple of emails between us. So uh, people would be surprised because they sound like we're, we're old buddies, but it may seem weird to members of the audience, but if they've read your book, mm -hmm. and I'm going to get you get this, it is right here, it's in the full screen, all right? The Short Book Formula, A Financial Professional's Guide to Writing a Book in Six Weeks to Attract Ideal Clients. If they read this book, they are going to get it why you and I are a okay, simpatico here, because one sentence that I think should get our loyal listeners' heads kind of bobbing here, uh, and the viewers nodding along as well, is a sentence on page 30. And it reads, the single most valuable benefit of becoming an author is accelerating the speed of trust. No. And uh, that sounds an awful lot like some of the phraseology I've used over the years of accelerating relationships, whether it's with social media, podcasts, or video, just accelerating kind of the relationship between you uh, and folks. So, um, you know, man, uh, let's jump into it. Can you walk us through what you mean by accelerating the speed of trust and like how you've come to this realization. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm going to I'm going to take you back in time for about oh, seven machines. or eight years. And I, I launched my my company more clients more fun in 2015. Prior to that, I did something completely different, completely unrelated to financial professionals unrelated to online marketing. And I, I, I in 2015, I launched my business and it was based around helping financial advisors use LinkedIn to generate mm. more leads and appointments and ultimately more clients. In 2016, I had massive, massive success with a, a, a client of mine at the time. His name was Shane Walls. And Shane was already a, a very successful life insurance producer. He's doing a couple hundred thousand dollars a year of target premium. And through our collaboration, he was able to go from that to over two and a half million dollars of target premium in, I want to say about two years. Wow. And so this was my introduction really to the world of working with financial professionals. And as you can imagine, with that, with that success, his producer group, his, you know, all the people around him, his, you know, life insurance carrier, et cetera, they're like, okay, you know, what are you doing? What's your secret sauce? What's going on here? And that elevated me from working with just, you know, single individuals that found me online to suddenly now I was speaking at events. I was being brought in to speak at big events for, you know, big, big influential organizations. Now I can continue the story or if you want to, um, Oh no, let's go. I can't wait to hear this yeah. story. This is great. I love it. Yeah. Well, cause well, I tell you why I like this because, uh, first of all, I think people do like origin stories, but I, it's, Already, this story is resonating, I think, with our audience, right? You know, financial advisors, and many of them are insurance providers who also kind of provide financial advice, whether that's through annuity products or others. And uh, understanding, like, wait a minute, somebody made that big of a leap that almost a 10x uh, jump in, in, in their revenue, right? And their, yeah. in their, 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 their income uh, in a short period of time, they want to hear about it. So let's go. 100%. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, I, I felt that I had struck gold, you know, it's like, if I can do this yeah. with Shane, I can do this with everybody. Imagine, you know, how, mm. how, you know, how well I'm going to do creating more Shane Walls's. And what I found was that Shane was a little bit of a unicorn, you know, just to be honest, okay. he was a little bit of a unicorn and, you know, for maybe a various reasons, just the personality, the, you know, whatever he brought to the table initially, and what I added to that allowed for those results. And so as I continued to build my LinkedIn business around helping advisors and at that time, primarily life insurance producers get more leads, I had, I had a, a, a range of results. I had some people that were successful, a lot of people kind of in that moderate range and some people that were not so successful. And I'm an, I like to think of myself as a innovator. So you know, status quo bores me. And it's, even when it's working, as soon as something's working, it's like, I want to see, okay, how can I break this and make it better? And yeah. so I've always been fascinated by the topic of influence um, more broadly. 
And as I continue to just to, you know, watch and see results and kind of think, okay, how can we make this more effective? How can we create more Shane Walls's as a result of our process? Mm -hmm. I stumbled upon another person whose name was Matt Zagula. And he, he's the, the founder of a group called the Smart Advisor Network. He wrote a book through Forbes called Smart Retirement. And we ended up working closely together for roughly three years. And the innovation at that point was that he had really a turnkey system for financial mm. advisors built around his book. And we essentially married what he had, what he already had developed with what I had developed on the LinkedIn side, put it together, and immediately we started to see much more consistent results for advisors in terms of getting leads and getting appointments and much higher close ratios when it came to hmm. turning leads appointments into new clients and new revenue. Again, though, I'm, a, I'm an innovator. Once th something's working, guess what I want to do? I want to break it. <laughs> I want, to, yeah. I want to think, how can I make this even better? <laughs> and so, you know, everything has its has its strengths. Everything has its weaknesses. And a few of the weaknesses that I saw. So, so first of all, I learned a ton. And so, I'm I'm I'm, I'm very grateful to Matt, um, just for about two or three years that we worked together and the lessons that I learned, and the insights that really you have to be hands on and working with someone. I mean, almost like a mentor that's been doing it to really right. quickly absorb those lessons and get to the next level. And during that time. I, you know, my own observations came to some of the challenges with that approach was that an advisor handing out someone else's book is okay, but an advisor handing out their own book would be even better because the authority yeah. and the credibility and all of those things reflect to the author, not to the person who's distributing the book. So that was one of the key things. The other thing and this is this became the birth of the short book formula, is that some of the consistent feedback that I got from the dozens and dozens of smart advisor um, uh, clients that we mutually worked with who were doing this approach was that yeah you know we sent out the book and no one's reading it. <laughs> you know, yeah. they got a lot of response of TLDR too long didn't and, read. And, and, <laughs> and, and so you know it's like people are like appreciative. There's like sure, yeah. and but at the end of the yeah. day. No one's really reading it and it's expensive yeah. to send out. I mean, you know, to yeah. send out a physical copy was like something like $15. And so it's like, I don't know if you ever were a Seinfeld fan, but there was an episode where it's like, um, this is probably a little bit off color, but is, is he sponge worthy? And I don't know why I went yeah. there, but. <laughs> Book worthy. <laughs> <laughs> but Look, it's almost like. We are, uh, everybody's adults here. I highly doubt we got any under 18 year olds <laughs> listening to our podcast, right? And uh, no, it's totally true. We have a finite. You, uh, uh, yeah. Go look at the Sponge Worthy episode, yeah, by the way, if you haven't seen it. Just go to YouTube, Seinfeld. put Seinfeld, Sponge yeah. Worthy, you'll get it. Yeah. If, you have, if it doesn't immediately a, come to mind. But it, it came relatively down to, finite this, research. It, it came down to, is this person book worthy? And it's like, ah, you know, I don't want to yeah. you know, give away this book if they're not like really yeah. committed. And, and so, you know, just, you know, analyzing this, hearing success stories, seeing challenges over the course of three years, I realized, again, that number one, the media improvement could be is that the advisor should be the author because yeah. that elevates their status, creates more credibility. And in a world, especially online, you know, that is the currency. It's there's plenty of opportunity. There's plenty of yeah. leads. There's, you know, there's a whole ocean full of leads out there for you, but to successfully attract them to you and seamlessly convert them from lead to new ideal client, yeah. you need to have your own authority, status, credibility, et cetera. And, and, yeah. and then that leads into the <laughs> second thing is that the message is only as good as it's consumed. And so I don't want people mm. to get the book and say, oh, well, you're an author, but I have no idea what that means. It's I want them to actually not just use the book for as a lead tool, but as a sales tool, it becomes invaluable. If you can get your ideal prospect to first raise their hand, show interest, but then as part of the sales process to take the time to read the book and make that a reasonable request that they do so, what you'll find or what I've found and what the people that do this process have found is that by the time you're having your first and at max second call, they're like, okay, what's next? How do I sign up? You know, yeah. so you radically condense a sales cycle from a process of having the, you know, multiple meetings, chasing people. Why did they go dark? Why aren't they calling me back? 
to yeah. their scheduling on your calendar. They're asking, when can we start? <laughs> You're saying, ah, I, I have a waiting list. <laughs> we can yeah. squeeze you in next month, <laughs> maybe sooner. And so it just completely flips the script. Um, so they need to be an author, but they also need to write a book that the reader can realistically read. And so I found that with a short book, it's around 12,000 words, you know, it can give or take a couple thousand, um, sure. but it's 12,000 words and the ideas that someone can read or listen to an audio book in roughly 60 to 90 minutes. It makes the point. It makes the impact. It takes oftentimes what could be dull financial jargon and turns it into interesting stories, compelling stories that make the point so that by the end of it, when you're saying, hey, and the logical next step is to reach out and talk to me, person's like, I want this. Yeah. You know, what's really interesting about this. I mean, this, this builds on the, I mean, first of all, this is an age old concept, right? Of like people, when people read your book, if you are by de definition, some sort of authority figure, we're going to be talking about that here in a second, but just because they've chosen to consume this, you, you clearly know what you're doing. It's on this paper and right? we've, we've been brought up the thing <laughs> that way. Um, but content marketing has been working this way for a very long time, right? That, you know, if if somebody is consuming your content and whether that content is in print in a book, it's audio book format, it's video, or it's a blog post or it's social media, they are seeing you there. And now they're hearing it in their head. They're, they're reading this unless they already know what your voice sounds like and they're thinking, and, and they digest it. And if they stick with a, like you said, about a hundred page book, 12,000 words, if they actually work their way through this, they're committed too, right? So yeah. the, the, to your point of accelerating trust, uh, it, it's working. It, right? <laughs> it also creates a, a process for you or a track to run on because, you know, again, with authority marketing, it's not just this this fancy concept. It's like, oh yeah, I want to be an authority. And I want to have status and credibility. It's you need to walk the, you know, you need to to to, to walk. What is that? You need to talk the talk and walk the walk, which right, means right. that you need to be willing. That if someone isn't willing to go through your process as as you've laid it out, they're not a good fit. Sure. Um, you know, I work with a variety of advisors and, you know, today I work primarily with, you know, I call them a holistic, you know, financial advisor, wealth managers, life insurance producers, you know, tax attorneys, um, CPAs that do advanced tax planning. So just kind of this whole range. And that's why I say financial professionals, because it kind of encompasses this whole range. Yeah. But I routinely get people that do a billion dollars of AUM schedule on my calendar. I, I don't know who they are until that we have yeah. had the talk, but you know, you know, at first I'd be like, Oh wow. You know, that's, that's like, you know, really important person. I need to, I need to, you know, change the way that I go about this. It's like, no, it's like they scheduled. I'm going to send them my, at this point, my audio book and say, Hey, before our call, do me a favor. And can you read or listen to this book? And then that way you'll have a basic understanding of uh, my philosophy, how we work and how I can help you so that when we do talk, we can really talk about what's most important for you. But I want that pre-education to be there, and that's what really facilitates the, pro the, 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 the speed of trust, facilitates the speed of going from you know lead to appointment to new ideal client. Yeah. I really like that, and you call that out in the book, that, that notion of like asking somebody to read something that is a reasonable investment, or, and, and so that could be reading, could be watching a video, could be whatever, well, asking somebody to to basically make a small investment before they earn your time, right? Yep. It's like a filter, right? Like, hey, there's 7 billion people in the world. Not all of them are right for you for, as a client. You know, there's 330 plus million people here in the United States, right? So you're not going to run out of clients, trust me. Uh, and you're no longer, you know, restricted to your neighborhood for, for your client base, right? You can actually be national now with things like Zoom and so forth. So... You, you, have, you can afford to be choosy. These are the people I want to work with, people who actually are being willing to follow whatever my system is that I put out into the world well, and, and, and understand it. And, 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 and part of that is that, you know, I'd like, to, I'd like to say that what proceeds is what follows. And so if you establish the process and the sales process, guess what happens? They become an ideal client. Um, they become yeah. someone who, you know, as an advisor, you know, to really earn the right of trusted advisor, they have to respect you but they also have to be willing to follow your leadership. I think, uh, I yeah. think a successful advisor, advisor is primarily a good leader and they need to yeah. be able to influence their clients to make decisions that they wouldn't necessarily make on their own. And so, yeah. you know, if you come in the other way and you're chasing, you're like, you know, you come across as a salesperson, it's like how, you know, it's like, call me, you know, and all these different things, guess what? 
they're going to probably be not the best client because they see you as a salesperson. They, they don't see your time as important. You know, all these myriad of things that, you know, cause all of the problems that most people, you know, unfortunately suffer from in their day-to-day operations. And so it really just flips the whole script, um, but it takes a vision of that's what you want. And then it really takes, I think, the determination and really I want to say boldness or the courage to say, this is how I'm going to live my life. And by extension, this is how I'm going to run my practice. Yeah, I absolutely love it. Um, you know, what are the other core tenets of your business? And, and by extension, the book, obviously, yeah. is this concept of authority marketing. Yep. And we've kind of you know put our finger on it a little bit here so far. Yeah. Uh, so let's spend some time there because I think it's, it's really powerful. And I think it's different than just the notion of trust, right? It's getting a little more granular, if you want to call it that, because anybody could write a book. And if I wrote a book about dog walking and tried to use it to get financial clients, I'm not sure that it's going to work, right? <laughs> uh, it's got to be somewhat relevant yeah. to the audience and relevant to the, the the services I provide. And so for me, it feels like it's really related to niche marketing. Mm-hmm but it feels like it's carrying a little more weight, Mm -hmm. right? So I wonder if you might kind of expand on the concept of authority marketing and and, and what you mean by that concept. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just a little bit of a background. Um, I'm a student of marketing, have been since, I want to say 2014. And out of all the people that I've studied, probably my my guru of choice, as I like to say, is Dan Kennedy. Um, And Dan Kennedy, if, if you're familiar with his work, I mean, I think he, you know, talks about and, and, and teaches authority marketing like no one else. And so a lot of what I've learned is, is from him. And the idea behind authority marketing is that, and, and how to really elevate from just niche marketing, let's say, is that there's certain things that just, you know, human beings are wired to respect. And I think, and, 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 and trust, I think there's three things. I think it comes down to three things, really. That it's speaking, and what we're doing right now on a podcast, yeah. you know, hosting a podcast, being a guest on a podcast, speaking on stage, whatever it may be, video perhaps, that's a form of authority because, you know, and, and I think the real reason is, is that most people are afraid of it, right? So when we see yeah, someone that goes out sure. there and actually does it, we immediately have respect for them. And by extension, if they're, you know, they're willing to put, put themselves out there and talk to a group there's this instinctual feeling that they know what they're talking about. You know, I mean, sometimes they can prove us wrong, obviously, but, you know, just the bias is in their favor. And the same thing happens with authorship is that with authorship, it's probably on a lot of people's bucket list. I mean, most advisors I've talked to that are not authors. It's like, oh, you know, I wish I could do that, but, you know, don't know what to do and what the next step is, et cetera, et cetera. And it's just the reality that most people, you know, writing a book, we try to make it easy, but at the same time, you know, it takes, it takes effort. It takes a willingness to put your ideas out there and, you know, and and have ideas, right? Have an opinion. And because of all those things, I think just human beings are ingrained to highly respect um, and trust people who, um, you know, speak and write books. And of course, as you amplify that, I mean, you know, if you watch the news, for example, and you have someone who's, you know, on whether it's Fox or CNN or whatever, you know, and now they're talking on the news, suddenly it's like, wow, you know, this person's a, a celebrity. And so, it, it, sure. you know, so, so I use the word celebrity lightly. So it doesn't mean that, you know, you're suddenly Paris Hilton or someone like that, but it does, it does create <laughs> this effect that, you know, you have, your time's valuable. I think, I think at the end of the day, you know what you're talking about. Your time's valuable. And I'm lucky as a consumer or a prospect or client to be able to work with you and get some of your valuable time. And by extension, I mean, the magic of it is not only do I appreciate the work that you do for me, but now I'm excited to brag to my friends and family and colleagues. Oh, I I get to work with this person and they're special. And, you know, it goes from, it flips the script again on referrals. It goes from this, oh, you know, you know, who who can you refer me to? And it's like, hey, I have like these five people who I'd love to refer to you. How can I do it? (laughs) Yeah. I got to tell you, that's one of the things that jumped out to me. It, it, you know, you talked about in the book, you talk about asking for referrals and you can use the book uh, as, as a mechanism to do that. But one of the things that jumped out to me was some of the books that you have and your team have helped uh, write are very specific, yep. right? Like they're for, for nurses yep. and their financial well-being or, or whatever. It's like, oh, so not only are we talking about a specific audience in terms of, uh, and we're diving to audience a little bit more later, but uh, we're also talking about 
a problem that that audience has, right? Uh, business owners who want to pay less taxes. Yep. or so, It's like, oh, okay, so it's not just any business owner. It's business owners who are really concerned with taxes. Not every business owner is overly concerned yep. you know, with, with tax management, right? So I, I, I like that because that's, we're not only talking about, again, a specific audience, right? So the niche, right? We're talking about a problem that they may have. And because we have a book, we have some thoughts on paper yep. in front of them. We've demonstrated we have an authority on you and the problem you have. 100%. Come talk to me. 100%. <laughs> I was just on the podcast yesterday with a gentleman who you may know, um, Bill Cates. Um, and he's yep. been in the industry for a long time. And his his whole thing is referrals. Um, and he just wrote a book called Radical Relevance. And so I just love the concept of relevance. It's, it, it, you know, yeah. part of this whole equation is that, you know, you could step back and say, hey, I can help people make more money. I can help people save on taxes, but guess what? You're relevant to nobody at that point because the message right. just flaws, falls flat. And so you really have to pick and choose who you want to be relevant to. I mean, that's like yeah. decision number one. And then once you've made that decision, you really have to understand the world from their perspective. I'll give you an example of this. Um, one of my uh, clients, and he, he's in the book, we talk about him, his name is Michael Budnick. And so when we started, you know, he'd just written a book for, you know, business owners and professionals broadly, but immediately it's like, okay, that's, you know, it's going to fall, it's going to fall flat because it's not really specific. It's not specific enough to any group. And so we've recrafted that to um, this book here, which is The Prosperous Nurse, Your Roadmap to Wealth, Health, and Happiness. And this book is geared to make him super relevant to a very specific group of people, which is not just healthcare professionals, but nurses. And so you can imagine yeah. if you're a nurse and you saw this book, you know, it speaks to you. It's like, hey, I need to know more about that. <laughs> I'm a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> Where, whereas I, you know, versus maybe the, you know, the other title could be, I help people save more money for a retirement book. Yeah. I don't care about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're becoming much more relevant to a specific group, but then by extension, and, and this is where I really love the, I think it's the synergy between authorship, you know, authorship by itself is good. And I think speaking by itself is good, but there's a magical synergy between the two, because I mean, what, what am I doing myself right now? I published my book at the beginning of this year. Guess what my next step was? I need to go on some podcasts. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Get out here and start spreading the gospel as they would. <laughs> you know, it's, what I like about, I mean, you know, it, it's, it's really true. It's, you know, it's very similar to what I tell people about podcasts, right? It's like, listen, one of the things you may be concerned with is the size of the audience when you start speaking all right? and what, or you're writing a book. You might think, oh, well, maybe only a few hundred people might read it or listen to my podcast. And it's like, yeah, that's awesome. Are you kidding me? If a few hundred people come and listen to a podcast, that is amazing if you've done a good job making sure that you're talking about the things that a specific audience cares about because that's what you want. You want to be talking to, in my case, the modern financial advisor uh, or people who want to become a modern financial advisor, right? In your case, it's financial professionals who would like to grow their business and you're going to show them how they can use a book, a short book uh, that they can write to develop you know, authority and, and so on and so forth and use this as a tool. I love it. And as soon as, and then, and, you know, then the question is how do I get, how do I market this? And, you know, my specialty is helping them on LinkedIn, but then the next thing is, well, you should start a podcast. <laughs> yeah, go, right. go, go, you should go talk to Mike. <laughs> it's, it's true. It, it is, you know, and, and we're, we're, so while we're here on the audience and I had this down in my notes of like, we were talking about this in, in a little while. So we're already into it, in it here. So forgive me for jumping ahead, but uh, look, man, you got to know who you're talking to. You know, I, I tell people that all the time and, and I'm sure you spend because a lot of time with your clients talking about that because it is one of your core steps, right? I, you asked a question, I think question number three you asked them is who is your primary audience? No. And I use that phrase too, instead of niche market or, or target market, even though it's in that category, I say, who's the audience? No. Who are you talking to? No. Because as an example, I'll give you a very specific example. I always tell people like, look, if your clients are, let's just say, uh, owners of uh, a blue collar business like auto shops or whatever, you're not going to show up to every meeting suit and tie. You should look, you know, a little more casual. The language you use on your website should speak to the things that are important to them, the way that they talk. You know, you have to, I'm not talking crass language. I'm just talking about don't don't try to win them over with you know ten dollar words, right? 
Versus if I'm talking to somebody in the tech industry, I might want to speak about what in a way that shows I know the tech industry. Heck, I want to go native too. I need to be showing up at tech events. You know, I need to be showing up at other things that are relevant to that audience. And I always tell people like, you know, you can think about it like this, you know, some people use the word client to describe their customer. Some people use the word diner. Some people mm -hmm. use the word patron and some people use customer or whatever, mm -hmm. or member, yeah. right? So if that could be true, then you need to start thinking about your audience that way too. Like what are the things they care about? What's important to them? Uh, because it makes all the difference. They, they automatically know if they're in the right spot, yep. just as somebody knows they're in, they've picked up the right book, right? 100%. As, as, as you were saying that, um, one more example came to mind for me about authority. I think for a lot of us, you know, even though we probably think of ourselves as confident and whatnot, I think, you know, a lot of us suffer at, to, to some degree from imposter syndrome, right? You know, yeah. it's like, who am I to do whatever? And sure. what I love about authorship and how it lends itself to establishing authority marketing is that once you have your book, it's amazing that you're confidence naturally goes up because it, it is an accomplishment yeah. and you start seeing the feedback you get from those around you. Suddenly it's like, Oh, you're an author. Mm. Um, I, you know, I like to show the story that bef before I published my, my first book, I, I did it backwards. I, I, I got the, the, the cover done and then I put it, I just put the cover on social media. I got all this great feedback, like, ah, you know, congratulations. You know, it's so impressive, whatever. And I was like, and that satiated me for about six months. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. I need to actually go back and, and write the book <laughs> <laughs> so I can put it on the world. But the, 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 the broader point I wanted to make is that as your confidence builds and you see that you have value to offer, and that you can talk about it from the perspective of an educator versus as a quote unquote salesperson, suddenly you're looking for like all kinds of opportunities to get your message out. I mean, you know, you want to be on podcasts, you want to invite people on your podcast. Um, right. And the key thing about this, and this taps into the idea of authority is that you really want to, you know, it's like the whole idea of centers of influence, right? It's like, um, would you rather get one client at a time or would you rather get 10 clients at a time? And so as you network and build relationships with centers of influence that are likewise relevant to your target audience or reader, suddenly you start getting exponential results because you're able to bring on people 10, 50, 100 at a time versus one on one. And the funny thing is, is, th is that the work is the same. <laughs> it, doesn't yeah. it doesn't take any more energy or effort to build a relationship with a center of influence as it does a, you know, quote unquote, regular, ordinary person, it's the same amount of time and effort, but you just have to have the vision, the strategy, and ultimately the tools to do so. I love that you point that out. And I've heard that used in different cases over the, over the years of like, look, it takes just as much effort to try to win a client who has, I don't know, $200,000 of AUM, uh, than to go after somebody who has, I don't know, $5 million, right? Sometimes like, it's easier to go after the higher person because it's less, it's less, you know, it's, it's less of a, it's less of an emotional decision for them just because yeah. it's like, oh, you know, it's 5 million, whatever. Whereas the person who's, you know, doing 50 to hundred, it's like, ah, you know, this is like everything I, I, you know, I don't, you know, I need to really trust you. <laughs> well, they, and they haven't developed, they, they haven't had wealth yet. So they might be very nervous with that. Right. And, they, yeah. and they're more concerned. Like, so, but the other, to your point, the, the person with a larger account, oftentimes, if you're going to put the work in, you might as well put the work in and go after something uh, bigger. Exactly. Um, Let's uh, let's shift gears into the use cases of the book. Yep. So one of the things you you talk about in your specific book is you call out, hey, listen, I wrote this book because, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I want to teach you how to do this, and I also, frankly, want you to do it with me. Yep. I want this is like a sales tool for me and my yep. business. And the reason why I want to address the use case, and then kind of maybe some you know, a couple of examples of, of, of actual prescriptive, like how the, they get implemented mm -hmm. in the world, is that's different than what I've seen from other books, right? Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen, I've had several authors on, on this show. All of them are good people, smart people. Some of their books are better than others. Mm -hmm. But I, I have to say, like, you're the first person to like really use the book in a very specific targeted way. So how do you recommend an advisor use their book? Like once it's written, like how do they go about getting it into the world? I mean, this isn't, we're not looking to see these on the shelves of Barnes and Noble necessarily, right? No, I, I, I don't even know if Barnes and Noble still is a thing or not. I mean. <laughs> oh, it is. 
<laughs> my kids love it. I don't know. It's like they're both going retro. My one of them, my, my oldest is into vinyl, and the youngest is like a just like a book junkie. Like her library is off the hook. He's, he's, and so, like at least once a week, she's at Barnes and Noble. She's got a touch and feel. She, she's rebelling. She she's like, I'm going to show you, Dad. I'm not going to go to Amazon. I'm going to go to. I'm going to go touch. I'm going to the bookstore. Oh no, for her, it's it's very important the condition of the book and like and she it, it's really fun to watch. She loves books like in a very special way and it's really kind of cool to watch her shop because it's yeah it's uh, a lot so anyways okay go back i sorry yeah, barnes yeah, and noble yeah. is the thing so but that's not our goal we don't want to be a bestseller at barnes and noble if that happens wonderful but not not yeah. opposed to it right um but that's not the goal and i'll just walk you briefly through the process and then i'll get into some a couple of use cases so first and foremost why write a book my approach and philosophy and is it's not it's not as much as we talk about using it as an authority piece and being seen as an expert, it's really not the way that we go about it. It's not designed to be your life story. It's not designed to, you know, be a war and peace of everything that, you know, I, I think, I think that has its place, but it's not what my process is designed to do to help financial professionals at, you know, a very simple analogy would be is that it's, it's the best business card you can have. Mm. You know, most people get a business card if they're meeting in person, or they might get a brochure from someone. Sure. And guess what happens with it? It goes right in the trash can, most cases, or it gets That's thrown right. into a drawer and never to be seen again. What I love about a book as really a piece of marketing collateral, and that's the best way to view it, is that people tend not to throw it away. People, even if they don't read it right away, they tend to keep it on their desk. They tend to put it on their bookshelf. And the reality is, is that people are going to buy when the timing is right for them. You know, when the circumstances in their life are such that now they feel a little bit of pain or a little bit of desire and they want to make a change. And that's where, whether that's immediate, whether that's three months down the road or a year down the road, you want your book to be accessible to them. So that's first and foremost. It's the business card that packs the most punch. Let's talk a little bit about process. And so our, our program is designed to help financial professionals write and publish their book within about six to 12 weeks. And we can do it honestly, in, you know, as soon as six weeks, sometimes the process takes a little bit longer, um, but it's a very simple process that's built around meeting with a person once a week on Zoom. It's a very structured and guided process that we take them through. But the key to it is that the, the, our client does not need to be a writer. You know, mm. I think that's one of the biggest barriers that people have. One, what's the process? What I do? But the second is I'm, I'm not a writer, which is perfectly yeah. fine. I mean, if you have thoughts, opinions, experience, stories, and you have a goal to grow your business, that's really what we're looking for in terms of a good fit for us. So we take people through the process. And at the end of six to 12 weeks, we publish it. We help them publish it. And we do it for them to Amazon. And Amazon really, and the reason that we do that is that it's just, you know, it just, you know, like everything that Amazon does, it's, 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 uh, you're able to publish it there. You're able to print a single copy on demand. Gone are the days of That's having wild. to buy, you know, 5,000 copies and storing them in your garage and letting them collect dust. You can literally print a, a single copy on demand. If you have Amazon Prime, which most people have, Amazon will print it and ship it for free all for the cost of roughly $3.50. That's amazing. And just compare that to like any other lead program that you have, any other marketing collateral that you have. I mean, the cost of postage to, you know, to send something to, <laughs> to someone is, <laughs> is, is right there. And oftentimes it gets thrown away and never open, right? So again, the, the idea is to get it out into the world in a very cost-effective way. And so, you know, every person, and it's not even really to be found. And so it's not like, hey, you know, I'm going to go be found on Amazon and people are going to find it there, which is really the modern day Barnes and Nobles, right? It's, that's not the purpose. Yeah. The purpose is through your intentional marketing efforts, once you publish the book, whether it's having your own podcast, guesting on podcasts, using tools like LinkedIn to create awareness around it, some people will go and buy it, but it's not to make a profit. You know, we intentionally encourage people to mark it down to the very lowest price, primarily because most times you're the one buying it and se selling it. So there's no reason to you sure. know, jack up the price for yourself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and so at the end of the day, I think it's a very revolutionary system, which, you know, there's no gatekeepers. There's no, there's no one that 
there's no one's permission that you need to be able to become a published author. You just need to have the courage and confidence and vision to do it. And once you do it, and once you create the manuscript, you know, ideally with our, or we, we, you know, recommend with our help, but you can do it alone yeah. um, or with someone else. You published the Amazon and now you have, I think, one of the most valuable pieces of marketing collateral that exists. And this will last not just a day or a year, but it can potentially last years and possibly even a decade. So, and I know the answer to this question, but I just want to like ask it kind of in a ridiculous fashion. So obviously we're not asking people to, as you said, buy thousands of books and just walk around just handing them to everybody who who moves. What are some scenarios in which uh, you, you can share that people who have published their books, get them in the hands of the people they want to have the book in their hands of. Yeah. Um, I have a couple case studies that I prepared from clients of mine. Um, and I know we, we have a, we have a cutoff at some point, but let me share the first one, which I think is probably is most impactful and will resonate with people. So Mark Miller, he's been a client of mine for about two to three years now. We started by helping him publish his book and the book itself, it's called, the tax-free business owner, how business owners can use the tax code to legally pay zero taxes. Now, I don't know about you, but as a business owner myself, if I see that title and I see that subtitle, I need to know what's in the book. You know, it's like, right. I, I just need yeah. to know what's in the book because, you know, I don't like taxes. And if someone's, you know, raised my curiosity to, to believe that there's a better way of potentially hitting zero taxes, I want to know what that is. So Mark came to us, we first helped him um, write and publish his book. And then he came back and said, okay, how can I promote this? And that's where we, um, he joined our uh, LinkedIn program, um, which is, is, you know, most of our authors do. And we essentially run it as a turnkey system. He doesn't have to be on LinkedIn. He doesn't have to figure out LinkedIn, but we run it completely as a turnkey system for him and people like him. Um, so we take advantage of all the great things that LinkedIn can do once you know your target audience, we can systematically um, reach out to them, connect with them. And the offer that we have for them, because a lot of people who are experienced on LinkedIn, guess what they don't like? You're, you know, guess what they complain about? Oh, you know, someone wants to sell me something, right? You know, right, it's right. like someone wants to jump on a call and I, you know, just connected with you two seconds ago, right? That is the broken way of doing LinkedIn. <laughs> yeah, right, for sure. <laughs> and so what I love about the book is that it takes what LinkedIn really is, which is simply the modern day phone book, it allows you to target the right people, but it allows you to then give them what I call a value offer. It's like, hey, you know, great to be connected. You know, I see that you're a business owner. If taxes are a concern for you, I just published my book, you know, the tax-free business yeah. owner, how business owners can legally pay zero taxes. If that's of interest, I'd love to send you a complimentary copy. Now, if I'm on the receiving end of that message, guess what? I'm going to say, I'm going to say, yes, I'm going to click because right. you, know, yeah. you have my curiosity. I don't know you yet enough, but you've given me a value offer that willing to take me to the next step. And at that point we move them into essentially a landing page where they provide their information, they opt in. And then we have a whole nurture campaign through email that's designed right. to seamlessly take them from complete stranger to suddenly I need to know, you know, I need to schedule with you and I need to take advantage of this and all these good things. And once they show up on the call, because it's not to rush the process, right? It's to get the person to the call when the timing's right and when they're pre-educated enough to the value that you bring to the table. And Mark Miller reports to us, and this we've been doing this for a couple of years, is that his process is essentially that they initially have about a 20-minute call. And if they're a good fit and you know everything seems to work, he, he goes into about a 60-minute call and he closes it at 80%. And this is with wow. affluent business owners who are paying a minimum of 20000 a year in taxes who he doesn't know from Adam. I mean, you know, he's, he's not even running this thing because we're doing this in the background, you know, connecting these people, driving people through this process. But by the time they show up, you know, he's the best thing since, since sliced cheese or, you know, yeah. whatever other cliche you want to use. <laughs> yeah. Well, they're pre-qualifying themselves. Yeah. It's awesome. That's, that's a great use case. Okay. So we only have a couple of minutes left with each other, but I do want to tackle a fun one. Hmm. And and that is audiobooks, hmm. right? So we're seeing a dramatic increase in the use of audiobooks by people, of, frankly, from all walks of life. I think it's because, you know, uh, Spotify and, and you know, CarPlay, whatever is all built into our phones and, and their cars now. So it's, it, and I don't know about you, but I've always got my AirPods yep. in and I'm walking around the house or whatever. So while I personally do prefer paperback 
books or having the paper when I'm, if I, it's something I need to really understand and I want to get it, that's the format I go to. However, I enjoy audiobooks if I'm like, I need to get this information in my dome quickly, yep. right? Like, <laughs> I just don't have time to yep. dick around. Uh, do you recommend that financial advisors consider recording an audiobook version of, of their of their book? Or are you thinking, stick with paper, trust me, this is the way we go? I like both. I like both. Um, yeah. I think I think there's value to first, you know, to a paperback and getting that into someone's hands. And of course, the we'll call it the challenge, even though it's a short book, the challenge is always to get someone to read the book, to not skim the book, but to proper, you know, if the, right. if the book is doing its job, it's going to make the case for you and bring them to the conclusions that you want to bring them to through, you know, the persuasion that's going on throughout the book. But the key to that is that the, the the reader actually has to take the time to read it or to consume the content. Um, what I love about audiobooks, and I can say this for myself, is that you know I I, I get both physical books, I get audiobooks, but my preference is personally is to listen because I can be walking my dog, I can be doing some yeah. work, I can be doing whatever. I'm much more likely to consume an audiobook than I am a written book, or I'm much more likely to do it quickly. And if you tie this back to the sales process, like I have a call later on today with someone who heard me on another podcast, scheduled a call, you know, he does like a billion of AUM. And guess what I did prior to, to today's call is I sent an email, you know, looking forward to our conversation. If you have a little bit of time, here's a complimentary version of my book. Here, the audio book takes about yeah. an hour to listen to. Please listen to it in advance of our call. So that when we talk, we can really focus in on what's most important to you. Now, is he going to do it? I don't know. But here's the thing is that if <laughs> we'll he doesn't do it, I'm going to make that um, a part of scheduling a, a, a second call. Because I don't want to ever get to a second call without someone taking the time to have read or listen to my book. It doesn't really matter which one, which way they do. But I find through experience that people are more likely to take action around an audio book. Fantastic. And by the way, that is an old sales technique called negging. Uh, well, <laughs> I thought that was a pickup. But it's awesome. I, I thought negging was no, for, for, for picking no, up it's checks. No, I think it actually came from sales and then it <laughs> evolved into the, uh, into, the, into the dating scene. But it's, it's basically like, you might not be right for us, yeah, yeah. Ben, or, or it might not be right. This might not be the right time. And it's basically the person's like, whoa, 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 whoa. What? Yeah. Not the right time. I'll read the book. I promise. Anyway, it, it works listen, incredibly Paul, well. It, it works incredibly well with the right people. In the introduction to my book, I yeah. talked a story. I told a story about Tim who didn't do the homework, didn't read the book. I said, you know, this is not going to be a good use of our time. He then promised to read the book. Since then, he's become one of my best clients, great friend, referred the heck out of yeah. people. But yeah, it works. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. Well, listen, Paul, I know you have a hard stop. It's been fantastic having you on the show. People are absolutely going to want to follow up. What is your favorite website to have people come visit so they can follow up with you and learn a little bit more about the short book? Oh, I mean, yeah. My uh, uh, easiest one is to remember is more clients, more fun.com. And that will forward you to my short book formula.com website. And you can get, pick up a complimentary copy there and see a number yeah. of other interesting things about our programs and everything else. Fantastic. Well, this has been great. Thank you very much, Paul. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to and or watching this first episode of the rebooted Modern Financial Advisor podcast. It's so wonderful to have you here. As always, love to hear from you. Please do reach out. You can find us on all the places you like to find us. I'm easy to find. I'm at Mike Langford basically everywhere in the world. We'll be putting together the socials for this show to make it a little easier to find. We'll create an email and Maybe I already have one and you're seeing it below, uh, but we'll make it really easy for you to reach out and, and get in touch for suggesting guests and topics and so forth for the show as we get going. Okay. All right. That's it. Uh, hope you're having a wonderful day and uh, make sure you be nice to each other. We'll see you next time on the Modern Financial Advisor podcast. See ya. Bye. That part hasn't changed. Bye. <laughs> it's like my calling card. It's like my goodbye card. Anyway.